السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وبعد We praise Allah سبحانه وتعالى We send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم his entire household, all his companions, may Allah bless them all. May he bless every single one of us. May he protect us from all evil. May he grant us every form of goodness, ourselves, our offspring, humanity at large. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all. Brothers and sisters, this evening we will be going through the lives of two of the companions of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The first is Al-Miqdad ibn Amr ibn Thalabah radiyallahu anhu. He was a man who has a unique history. When he was young, his father, or in fact before he was born, his father, known as Amr ibn Thalaba, who was living in an area or from amongst the tribe of Buhra, he was living in an area where he had committed a crime, subhanAllah. And the crime was he murdered someone. So this person's father happened to murder someone and had to run away. He ran away fearing that perhaps they might get hold of me and they might punish me, penalize me and so on. And he ran away to Hadramaut. Hadramaut is an area in Yemen. So in Hadramaut, he stayed there for a while. He married someone from Hadramaut and he had a son. And the son was named Al-Miqdad. And this is the person who later became a companion of Muhammad Sallallahu Al-Miqdad, it is reported that he looked just like his father. He was very dark in complexion and at the same time he was a person who was very hot-blooded so to speak temperamental and as he grew up he had a few disputes with some of the people in Hadramaut one of them was an elderly man and they happened to fight with each other or he swiped him with a sword and cut part of his leg so Al-Miqdad just like his father ran away from Hadramaut and where did he go he ran to Makkah to Al-Mukarramah because he knew Makkah was considered a city and it was a very big city at the time compared to the other cities in the region. So when he went to Makkah, he realized that it's going to be quite difficult in Makkah because the people are very ignorant in Makkah. They fight with each other. They harm those whom they don't know. They usurp the wealth of those who are weak and they happen to enslave people sometimes whom they don't know and so many things are happening that are disastrous. At the same time, he used to question the worshipping of the idols that was occurring in Makkah to Al-Mukarramah. And Al-Miqdad ibn Amr, as a young boy, decided, or he was a young man, so to speak, he decided to strike a deal with one of the people in Makkah, that if anything happens to me, you will protect me. So who was this man? His name was Al-Aswad ibn Abdi Yaghuth. He was from the Zuhri in Makkah al-Mukarramah, the Zuhri tribe. So Al-Miqdad ibn Amr became so close to this man, Al-Aswad ibn Abdi Yaghuth, that one day Al-Aswad decided to inform Quraysh that this young man who is under my protection here in Quraysh, he has qualities that are very high. He is brave. They used to look at bravery. If a person was brave, they loved him. You know, if he could dare the world, they loved him because of bravery. So Al-Aswad says, I declare that he is my son from this day. And when I die, he will inherit me. And if he dies, I will inherit him. Now this was common amongst the Arabs. They used to declare this link that did not exist. It was a non-existent link, but they declared it in order to show how deeply they loved someone. So from that day, a lot of people began to call him Al-Miqdad ibn Al-Aswad. And I'm sure even in some of the books, it says Al-Miqdad ibn Al-Aswad radiyallahu an, Because of his link with Al-Aswad ibn Abdi Yaghuth. But the truth is, he remains Al-Miqdad ibn Amr ibn Thalaba radiyallahu an. So at that time, he was a person who began to hear from some of the fortune tellers as well as some of the religious men from amongst the Jews and the Christians when he used to travel he heard from from them they said it is about time that a messenger is coming in Makkah to Mukarrama it is about time that a messenger will come and perhaps he will be from Makkah 
So Al-Miqdad was thinking to himself that I hope I can meet this messenger, whoever he is. And so what happened is one day when he heard about Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he knew immediately, immediately that you know what? This has to be the man and it has to be true. I've heard it from so many people and I've heard it from religious people that this messenger is going to come. And if he is a messenger, his character and conduct is exemplary. And nobody spoke ill of him before he declared that he was the messenger. It is only after he declared he was a messenger that people said he was a madman, he was a magician and so on. So Al-Miqdad ibn al-Aswad was one of the first 10 to accept Islam. Some say number seven, but some say top 10, which means right at the beginning he accepted Islam. And then he went to tell his people or the people of Quraysh who were protecting him that you know what? I believe in Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and I believe that Allah is one and these idols will do nothing, no harm, no good and we should not be worshipping idols and I refuse to engage in what you've been engaging in and from today on I follow this new faith and new religion. And immediately they began to persecute him just like the others. So his name joined the names of Khabbab ibn al-Arat radiallahu an and the others like Suhaib al-Rumi radiallahu an Ammar ibn Yasir radiallahu an and the others. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all protection and may he make us from those who are always at ease with what we know is the truth from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without anyone snatching it away from us. So Al-Miqdad ibn al-Aswad, it is reported that in the early days he sought to marry. He wanted to get married, but he had two or three problems. One was his father had committed a crime and run away from somewhere to Hadramaut. Then he had committed a crime himself and run away. And at the same time, he had no family. And on top of that, he was big. He was a very big man, extremely dark in complexion, looking very different to the others. So no one wanted to give him their daughters. And then he accepted Islam and the same thing happened. But because he was involved in learning the Quran and learning the deen and his life was transformed, he was not really bothered about being married at the time. However, when Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam made the hijrah, he was unable to make the hijrah because of persecution initially. So it was only after Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam made the hijrah to Medina Munawwara, Al-Miqdad ibn Amr ibn Thalaba radiallahu an was one of the last who managed to make the hijrah. He too hatched a plan and he made the hijrah just like we heard Suhaib ibn Sinan al-Rumi did. So when he arrived in Medina Munawwara, the Prophet ﷺ was very, very happy, delighted to see Al-Miqdad because he showed a keen interest in learning the deen, very keen. As much as his background was what it was, but he, was, he became such a good man, a beautiful person, and he used to listen very carefully. He had a, really, he had deep-rooted love for Muhammad ﷺ, and he showed it. So when Muhammad sallallahu saw him, he was extremely delighted and told him, you know what? You can be from amongst the group who stay with me. And there was a small group of companions at one stage who stayed with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Some narrations say groups of 10. So the 10 that stayed with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa for a while in Medina Munawwara, one of them was Al-Miqdad ibn Amr. Now he says something unique happened. A miracle occurred. What was the miracle? He says, one day we had gone out and we came back. Three of us came back to the house of Muhammad وسلم, where we were staying. And he says, we entered the house and the little, you know, the room where they were. And every day there would be a bit of milk that would be left for us to drink. And on that day, there was milk that was left for us to drink. The three of us who entered, I was very hungry. He says, I was thirsty and hungry. So my two friends from the companions, they drank their share and they went to sleep. And I drank my share, but I could not sleep because I was still very hungry. And I looked at the share of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he had not yet come back to the house. He was still out. Perhaps he was in the masjid or elsewhere. So I thought to myself, you know what? I'm sure he will get something. Perhaps he will have something where he is. Someone will offer him. He will drink. He says, shaitan came to me and shaitan tells me, why don't you just drink his share? Come on, he's the Nabi of Allah. He's going to get. And he says, Shaitan continued to encourage me until I drank it. So he says, I, I drank that share of Muhammad wasallam. Then Shaitan comes back to me and makes me regret. And my brothers and sisters, this is what Shaitan does. 
He makes, he encourages us to do bad. Have you ever thought of something interesting? When we do something bad, Allah has blessed us in a way that we can turn back to Allah by blaming shaitan. Have you thought of that? So if I fight with you, for example, I can come back to you and say, brother, that was shaitan. I'm very sorry what I did. Subhanallah. Have you heard that? It's a nice way of apologizing. But the reality is, if we do not apologize, we become the devils ourselves. And if we don't turn back to Allah, we become devils. And this is why Allah says even in Surah An-Nas, speaking of the devils from jinn kind and the devils of mankind. And Allah has said this in other places in the Quran. Allahu Akbar. So this is why it's important for us to know that learn a lesson from Al-Miqdad ibn Amr ibn Tha'laba radiyallahu an, where he says, Shaitan made me do this. And as soon as I did it, he now makes me say, you know what? That was the messenger's milk. Now you're going to have problems. This is going to happen. Now you'd better run away. You'd better do this. You'd better do that. So many other thoughts and ideas. Remember one thing, regret. A sign of regret when you commit a sin is a sign of your belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you regret, it means you believe in Allah. But a sign of regret which is actually leading to more sin is not a sign of iman. For example, a person tells a lie, then they regret it. When they regret it and they stop lying, that is a sign of iman and belief. But when they regret it and it makes them say more lies, it is a sign that the devil is getting hold of you even further. So Al-Miqdad ibn Amr, he says, I thought to myself, what should I do? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa has three goats that were in the house or that were belonging to them. And he said, perhaps I can cut one of them and prepare a meal so that he can have. But at the same time, he says, I pretended to sleep, thinking so many thoughts. And next thing, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa knocked the door and he walked in. He had a habit of seeking permission as he walked in because in case someone might have been seated you know, in a position where they might be shy to, to see Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa in that position and so on. So when he entered, he had a habit of greeting in a way that those who were sleeping were not disturbed. And those who were awake heard it. So he says, I heard it. And I knew Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is back. Now what to do? So he looked at his container and he saw someone had drunk his milk. So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa raises his hands and makes a dua. He says, Allahumma at'im man at'amani wasqi man saqani. Oh Allah, feed the one who feeds me and quench the thirst of he who quenches my thirst. This is a dua, a sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So when that happened, Al-Miqdad ibn Amr got up and subhanallah, he was excited. He said, no, let me be from amongst those who feed Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tonight so that I can be fed and quenched by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he got up and he decided, okay, here's the knife. Let me go and see which one of those three goats is the biggest and I'll cut it and I'll cook it quickly for Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, obviously he thought to himself, wait, we are milking these goats to have the milk from them. What's going to happen if I cut it? And number two is if you cut it, you need the permission of the owner, don't you? So at the same time, as he is thinking, he notices the udders of that goat or the goats had been filled with milk, although they were milked just a little bit earlier. So that was a miracle. So he says, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa gave him a utensil and he called for the goat and he milked that particular goat. So much milk came from it that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa drank and Al-Miqdad ibn Amr drank and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa drank again and Al-Miqdad ibn Amr drank again radiyallahu an and then he tells Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa the story because obviously now Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa asked him, what's wrong? What's happening here? You know, so he says, this is the story. This is what occurred. So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told him, wallahi, even if you had got up those friends of yours to drink milk, more milk, it would have been sufficient for all of us. Subhanallah. This was a miracle of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And this used to happen very often to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa even prior to prophethood. From the time he was born, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he went with Halima to Saadiya to a place known as Badia to Bani Sa'd, in order to be suckled there, on the way there, you find the animals that were unwell, they were healed automatically. And when they went there, 
there was a lot of blessings in the food and in the produce of that particular area. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us even a little bit of barakah. From this we actually learn that sustenance is in the hands of Allah. We do not need to steal in order to feed ourselves because Allah will provide for us, but we should never be greedy at the same time. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us. So he wanted to get married. Now this was after he was a Muslim in Medina Munawwara. So he went to one of the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. In some narrations, a name is mentioned. In some narrations, a name is not mentioned. The name of Abdurrahman ibn Awf radiallahu anhu is made mention of where he asked him. Abdurrahman ibn Awf asks Al-Miqdad ibn Amr radiallahu anhu that why don't you get married? He says, well, why don't you get me married to your daughter? Subhanallah, what a beautiful question. You are really concerned about me getting married? Get me married to your daughter. So uh, Amr, uh, sorry, Abdurrahman ibn Awf radiallahu anhu immediately he says, look, you know what? I cannot get you married to my daughter. Well, he went to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam and complained that look, Abdurrahman ibn Awf asked me a question. When I asked him to marry me to his daughter, he refused. And he was quite upset. So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam says, wouldn't, like, wouldn't you like me to be from amongst your in-laws? Meaning, wouldn't you like it if I made you my own son-in-law? And what was meant here is related to me. Related to me through marriage. He said, yes, O messenger, why not? So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam got him married to his cousin. And her name was Dhiba'ah bint Zubair ibn Abdul Muttalib radiallahu anha. So he was so happy and he used to say, look, no one got me married to their relatives, but Muhammad sallallahu got me married to his own cousin. And now I have become a part of the family by being in-laws to that family. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah's peace and blessings be upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It is reported in the battle of Badr. He was the man whom, if you recall, they did not go to attack an army, but rather they went to get the caravan of Abu Sufyan, which was coming back from Asham with all the property and the wealth which was stolen from Quraysh. They had, sorry, it was stolen from the Muslims by Quraysh and taken to Asham to deal in. And when they came back with those prophets, this is when the Muslimin said that let us go and get hold of the caravan because as it is, it belongs to us. So Al-Miqdad ibn Amr was one of them who had a horse. He was one of the only ones who actually had a horse and they went out. Some narrations say there were three horses on the day of Badr and some say there was only one. But Al-Miqdad ibn Amr was one of them. They went out first to get the caravan and then Abu Sufyan had diverted. If we know the story of the battle of Badr, Abu Sufyan diverted and the Muslims followed until they got to the place of Badr. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa asked his companions, what should we do? So he asked Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. He asked Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu. Then he asked some other companions from amongst them was Al-Miqdad ibn Amr ibn Tha'labah radiallahu anhu. So Al-Miqdad says, O oh Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and this is recorded in history. We will not tell you that which the people of the book had told the Prophet Moses, may peace be upon him, that go you and your Lord, we are sitting back, the two of you can go and fight. We will tell you that you go and we are with you. Whatever you tell us to do, even if you tell us to go behind you as you are going across the sea, we will follow you across the same sea. He says, there is nothing that you instruct us today that we will not do. And he spoke so well that he encouraged all the companions and Muhammad ﷺ was very happy. And this is when they made a decision that let's go and we will tackle these people in Badr. And subhanallah, it was a battle that the Muslimin had won against all odds. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless these companions of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And a very interesting story at the time of Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu. It is reported that a man met Al-Miqdad ibn Amr radiallahu anhu and looked at him and said, I'd love to look into your eyes because your eyes are the eyes that looked at Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And I really love to look at these eyes. And I wish that I was from amongst those who had seen Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, if we heard someone say that, we would say, oh, mashallah, I wish too. I wish so too. Listen to the answer of Al-Miqdad ibn Amr. He says, Wallahi, thank Allah that today you are a believer. Listen to this. Because if you were there at the time of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam just to see him, 
There were so many people who saw him, but they are now thrown into Jahannam. They are thrown into hellfire, the likes of Abu Jahl and the others. They saw him, but it was such a big test at the time to follow the instruction and to be from amongst those who were Muslim. It was not easy. We were persecuted. We were harmed. So thank Allah that at least you were born and you are a Muslim and you are a believer today. But don't come and say, I wish that I was from amongst those who saw him because you don't know if you saw him, which side you would have died on. Now this was a shock. Because it is something, looking at something from a totally different angle. And it brings us a lot of goodness to say, let's thank Allah for Iman. I know it is correct for us to wish that we would have been there. But who knows, from amongst the companions, Allah chose these companions because they had one main quality in them. And that was they surrendered to the instruction of Allah and His Messenger. With us, someone tells us, brother, this is haram. We'll say, ah... What do you think? It's okay, it's fine, man. You don't know. Someone says, brother, don't do this. This is, he said, no, no, I'm still not ready to go for Hajj. I can continue sinning until I go for Hajj. That's the attitude. So one wonders if we were Sahaba, what would have happened? So thank Allah that at least we are here today. But we have a lesson to learn from this. So this man, Al Miqdad ibn Amr, he passed away. Some narrations say he was killed by his own servant, a, a servant of his. And he, he died in the year 33 Hijri whilst he was approximately 73 years old in an area known as Al-Juruf, just in the outskirts of Medina Munawwara, and he was buried in Al-Baqi'ah. May Allah's peace and blessings be upon him. The next hero we will be speaking about this evening, inshallah, Ubadat ibn al-Samit ibn Qais al-Khazraji al-Ansari, radiyallahu an. Ubadah ibn al-Samit, he was from amongst the people of Medina Munawwara and one of the first from Medina to accept Islam. Because the first pledge of allegiance that happened not the Hajj just preceding the Hijrah, but the previous Hajj. There were two pledges of Aqaba during Hajj. One was the year that preceded the Hijrah, and one was one year before that. This man, Ubadat ibn Samit, was from amongst the 12 members of the Ansar who accepted Islam in the first pledge of Aqaba. And he came back the following year to pledge again the second year of Aqaba and to call Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to Medina Munawwara. So this was Ubadat ibn Samit radiallahu an, a great man. He was a powerful person. He was one of the few who had actually witnessed both of these pledges as well as all the other battles including Badr. Do you know, if we talk about the battle of Badr, a person who took part in the battle of Badr is known as Al-Badri, Al-Badri. So they would say, Ubadat ibn Samit al-Badri. Al-Badri meaning he took part in the battle of Badr. So why was it so important to call them Badri? I tell you. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that he has forgiven all those who took part in the battle of Badr. Subhanallah. So that was an honor for them to be known as al-Badri. So this was Ubadat ibn Samit. He took part in the pledges. He took part in all the wars and the battles and all the uh, travels of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was a man, his father was called As-Samit ibn Qais and his mother was called Qurratul Ain. That was the mother of Ubadat ibn As-Samit radiyallahu an. He was one of those who was very keen upon learning the Quran. He took a great interest in learning the Quran. He listened to it very carefully. So much so that at the time of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiyallahu anhu, when they were gathering the Quran, bringing it together, he was one of those who was also responsible or he was one of those who was given part of the task. Even at the time of Uthman radiallahu an, he was one of those who was given the task. And he was known as a person who knew the Quran very, very well. So much so that he remembers the saying of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam regarding becoming a governor. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam says those who become governors on Muslim lands, they are responsible to fulfill what their duty is. And if they don't, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will punish them. When he heard this, he felt, I never ever want to be a governor. So he made it clear to everyone, I don't ever want to be a governor. And he was never a governor. So Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, when he was the Amir, he tried with Ubadat ibn al-Samit saying, O oh, Ubadah radiallahu anhu, you are a knowledgeable man. You have a lot of knowledge. You are one of those who has great virtue over a lot of others. 
and I want, to, I want you to be the governor. He said, no, don't even speak about being a governor. I will never do that because I've heard the messenger warning the people of how serious it is, what a big responsibility it is. So Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu then received a letter from Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan who was the governor of Sham. And Muawiyah radiallahu anhu tells him, O oh Umar, we need some people to come to us to teach us Quran and Islamic rulings. So Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu knew that now the number of Muslims is increasing and we need someone to go and teach them. So he chose five people and he called them. Who were these five? Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu an, Ubay ibn Ka'b radiallahu an, Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiallahu an, Abu Darda radiallahu an, and our hero of tonight, Ubadat ibn Samit radiallahu an. And he tells them, look, I've got a letter and I want to send at least three of you. So if you can go, let me know which one of the three could go. Immediately they said Abu Ayyub al-Ansari is elderly. He won't be able to go. And as for Ubay ibn Ka'b, he is sickly. He won't be able to go. And the other three, we will go. So the three of them went. And it's reported that Mu'adh ibn Jabal went to Palestine. Abu Darda radiallahu anhu went to Damascus. And as for our man, Ubadat ibn Samit radiallahu anhu, he went to Hims to do what? To teach the people Quran and to teach them Islam. So when he arrived there, he started teaching and so on. And he had some arguments with Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan. The reason is very clear. When he had arguments, people told him, why do you argue with this man who is the governor of Umar ibn al-Khattab? He said, Wallahi, he did not witness the pledge. I witnessed the first one and the second one and all the wars and the battles. And we are the ones who pledged to Muhammad that we will not fear when it comes to uttering the truth. So I'm only saying the truth. I'm only fulfilling my pledge that I had pledged one or two years before the Hijrah and the pledges that we pledged thereafter. So I pledge that I will not fear when it comes to uttering the truth and I will always speak the truth and we will always say that which pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we will stand for what is right and just. So this is why I speak. So Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan radiallahu anhu was very upset. Ubadat ibn Samit told him, you know what? I will never stay on the same land as you. I'm going back. He went back to Medina Munawwara. Ubadat ibn Samit radiallahu an. So Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu calls him in. Oh, Ubadah, what happened? He explains that, look, I had an argument with, or we had a disagreement with Muawiyah. And this is what he said. And this is what happened. And this is what I said. And I don't want to go back there. So Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu made his famous statement in connection with Ubadat ibn Samit radiallahu an. What was the statement? He says, Wallahi, no land will ever be successful if it does not have you or people like you in it. What does this mean? Someone to correct the people. We need people to correct others. So we need someone who can actually say, listen, you are wrong and so on and to discuss the matter. So he sent him back with a letter to Muawiyah saying, look, you are the governor of Asham. But you, one person you will not be a ruler over, and that is Ubadat ibn Samit. He will be a ruler over himself. Subhanallah. This was the letter that was sent by Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu to Muawiyah. And from that day, Muawiyah was very silent and he did not say anything until the time of Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu when Muawiyah wrote a letter again to Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu complaining about Ubadat ibn Samit radiallahu anhu. But he was a powerful man. It is reported that when it comes to the conquest of Egypt, Amr ibn al-As had sent for help to Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu saying, you know what? We are here in Egypt and we need some men. We need backup. So Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu sent 4,000 men to Amr ibn al-As in Egypt. And from amongst them, he sent four of the most powerful of the men. One of them was Ubadat ibn al-Samit radiallahu anhu. The other was Az-Zubayr ibn al-Awwam radiallahu anhu. The other was Al-Miqdad Al-Miqdad, the one we spoke about a few moments ago. Al-Miqdad ibn Amr radiallahu an, And Maslamah ibn Mukhallad radiallahu an, And he wrote to Amr ibn al-As saying, I have sent you 4,000 men. And as the head of every thousand, I have sent you one man each who is worth a thousand himself. Subhanallah. Which means these are powerful people. Anyway, the story is very interesting. When they got to Amr ibn al-As, they found that the Muslims had surrounded a certain area and the enemy refused to come out completely 
of that town. And so the leader of the enemies decided, you know what, these people are large in number and we definitely need to do something. Let us send some of our men to them in order to speak, to discuss. Let us try to strike a deal. And that was the norm. Up to today, I hope it is still a norm. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us prevent war wherever it is taking place. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to end the wars as well. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us all. Amen. So they sent three messengers to the Muslimin and they spent time. They spent three days with the Muslims speaking and discussing and so on. And they, they understood what the Muslims wanted and the Muslims understood what they wanted and they went back to their leader. When they went back to the leader, this leader al muqawqis he asks them, what did you see? They said, we saw something very strange. We saw people who are very, very humble. They do not want to be haughty or proud. We saw people who sit on the ground. We saw people who eat sitting on the floor. And we saw people whom you will never recognize who's the leader from the lead. They are all looking exactly the same. And we saw people whom when it comes to their prayer time, not a single person is lazing around. They are all praying. And we saw people who wash their faces with water several times in the day. So their leader told them, Wallahi, if this is their description and they love death more than we love life, if that is the case, even if you put a mountain in front of them, they will defeat the mountain. This was the statement. Now, why I'm mentioning this is because look at these qualities. Can we at least revive our prayer, our salah? Can we at least revive our simplicity? Can we at least become people who are humble? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us humbleness. And may he grant us these qualities. So amazingly, Muqawqis decides, you know what? We need to send or we need to call some of them to us. We want to see these men. So he wrote back to the leader or he sent a message to the leader, to Amr ibn al-As radiallahu anhu, saying, we want some of your leaders to come to us. We'd like to continue with these talks. So Amr ibn al-As sent 10 men. The head of them was our hero of tonight, Ubadat ibn Samit radiallahu anhu. So when Ubadat ibn Samit radiallahu anhu walked in, it's amazing how this man looks at him and told him, you know what? Speak to me in a calm way. Speak to me in a calm way. I just want to understand you a bit better. So Ubadat ibn Samit radiallahu anhu says, I see you fear me already. Subhanallah. You're just looking at me and you're so scared. I have a thousand men out there, a thousand men who are stronger than me and they would be feared more than I am. And this leader, this leader was shocked. He says, look, I understand what you're saying, but I want to warn you of something. What is the warning? He says, the Romans who are the colonizers of this land, they are coming to you with numbers that you will never be able to match. And they are bringing weaponry that you will never ever be able to overpower. Not at all. So I'm just warning you, we are not going to surrender. We will fight you. So Ubadat ibn Samit radiallahu anhu says, no problem. You don't understand what you have just said. We do not look at numbers. We do not look at anything else. We look at our conviction in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They went back. A little while later, Az Zubair ibn al-Awwam radiallahu anhu decides, that he is going to climb through the wall of that city and he's going to throw himself down and open the doors. They used to have gates around the cities and open the doors himself, come what may. And subhanallah, bravely, as Zubair ibn al-Awwam radiallahu anhu goes up and he jumped down saying Allahu Akbar. And he said, when you hear me say Allahu Akbar, all of you say Allahu Akbar and come through the gate. And that's exactly what happened. No sooner did they enter that gate than they became victorious. And subhanallah, it was a lesson even for their leader, meaning the leader of the enemy, to see that with numbers, nothing really helped. With sophisticated weaponry, nothing really helped. But it was the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it was what was right. And it was justice that actually prevailed. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us and may he grant us a good lesson. He passed away in Palestine. Ubadat ibn Samit is buried in Jerusalem, in Al-Quds. And he passed away the year... 
34 Hijri at the age of approximately 72. May Allah's peace and blessings be upon him and upon us all. These were some of the heroes of Islam. These are those who struggled and they strove in order for the deen to get to us. Wallahi, today we are seated with it on a platter. Yet we are lazy to even fulfill our salah or to correct ourselves and become better people. This is the month of Ramadan. We are here witnessing the 21st night of Ramadan. What a blessed night. My brothers and sisters, it's about time our hearts turned towards Allah and we became better people quitting the sins that we've been engaging in for so many years. It's about time we shed the warm tears of repentance turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Look at these who gave their lives so that the deen came to us. We have it on a golden platter. May Allah make us those who appreciate. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Subhanallah bihamdih. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika nashhadu an la ilaha illa ant. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk.